Hey everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, welcome to the seventh webinar in the I Am Masterclass series titled How to Engage, uh, Create Engaging Content in a COVID-19 World. For the next hour, we're going to talk to you about the changes and innovation we have seen across immediate media over the past few months. We'll be sharing some of the successes that we have seen, as well as our top tips for any brands creating content at the moment. I'm really excited to be joined by Imagine, our in-house commercial content business, and the editor of our largest cycling brand, Bike Radar. But before we start, I quickly need to run through some housekeeping. So we're recording this webinar and the link to the on-demand version will be shared in tomorrow's follow-up email, along with a copy of the deck. Everyone's going to be muted throughout the duration of the webinar. However, we still want you to ask questions using the Q&A functionality. So at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a button labeled Q&A. Once you've clicked this, you'll be able to write out your questions and we'll either answer them live or one of the team will write your response or we'll get back to you afterwards. On top of the Q&A, chat's also enabled. This can be accessed at the bottom of the Zoom window. Please do feel free to use this throughout. If you can't hear us or something isn't working, please do let us know in the chat and we'll try and resolve that ASAP. So from my team, I'm joined by Becky Watts. From Imagine, we'll be hearing from Jonathan Brown, Becca Bright, James Ramsey, Ross Shepherd, And then later on, I'll be running a Q&A with George Scott from Bike Radar. Thank you all so much for taking the time to chat to us today and also for pulling everything together ahead of today's session. For the past 86 days, the UK has been in lockdown. And although now eased somewhat, it has been an incredibly testing and tricky time for us all but it's been amazing to see the coming together of people as well as businesses. As a publisher, we've been really busy pivoting to meet user changing needs and demands while seeing some simply staggering growth across our digital properties. In the first week of lockdown, my team and I decided that we wanted to do as much as possible to help all of our stakeholders thrive during this time. So we launched the Iron Masterclass series, providing a completely unique insight into the work that immediate media is doing. We've had a great response with all the webinars available on YouTube as well. It's great to see that those that can't join us for these live sessions are still tuning in on demand. We'll share that link in tomorrow's email as well. So now that we've covered off the who, the what and the why, let's quickly run through the agenda for today's session. Firstly, Becky's going to give you all an introduction to content, why it's important and the most important part really of all marketing activity. Then Imagine's going to dive into Imagine's content proposition and the challenges and solutions presented by COVID-19. And then finally, we'll be joined by George, editor of The Bike Radar, uh, for a live Q&A. So if you do have any questions for him or for me to ask anyone, then please do submit these throughout the session. So over to you, Becky. Thanks, George. Uh, I'm Becky, and as George um, mentioned, I'm the business manager for social, native, and video at Immediate. Um, before we continue with today's session, I think it's just really important that we go back to the very basics and define exactly what we mean by content. So content is information that a brand publishes in order to market their business and build relationships with customers. Content conveys to potential and existing customers who your brand is, what you stand for, why they should care, and how you can help them. For immediate, content is the beating heart of our business. We've got some of the best content creators in the country coming together to write, film and talk about passion points, including cycling, cooking and crafting, to name just a few. So why is content important? Well, there's hundreds of reasons, but we've tried to consolidate these into three key points to best reflect um, today's webinar attendees. Firstly, content can often be a customer's first touch point with your business. I know we've got a couple of people on today that are from different marketing agencies, so I'm sure that you guys regularly communicate with your clients about what content they should be creating. Um, and even as a marketing agency yourself, creating content that can help answer your clients' questions is a really great introduction to your company that could lead to potential business. Secondly, good content creates loyal audiences. If you create content that people are interested in and can repeatedly do this, then people will keep coming back to your brand over and over again. This is applicable for all, whether you sell physical products, subscriptions, or offer a service. Thirdly, for a lot of businesses, whilst content isn't sales, it does contribute to the sales process. Demand Gen recently reported that 47% of buyers view at least three to five pieces of content before deciding to engage with a company. As a publisher, we wouldn't be able to sell any of our digital or print subscriptions if the content that we offered for free wasn't of good quality. In our previous webinars, we've touched heavily on how to adapt promotional strategies to best drive engagement. 
However, no matter how well a promotional strategy is executed, if the content isn't strong enough, then the results will speak for themselves. For our industry, the outbreak of coronavirus marks a time when us as creatives and marketers can no longer rely on big scale production for our content. This shift already started to happen in recent years, but it has now officially ground to a halt and everyone is on the same level playing field. That's not to say that production as a whole is over, um, it's just slightly different now. Even the term in-house has a new meaning as we're all literally working from our own houses. Lockdown has undoubtedly presented new challenges when it comes to content creation, but with that comes new and exciting ways to connect and communicate with our audiences. And on that point, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, Commercial Content Director of Imagine, to talk through exactly how they have worked through such challenges and produced some really exceptional content throughout this period. Thanks, Becky. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Bowne, and I'm the Commercial Content Director at Imagine, which is Immediate Media's creative content studio. Imagine is responsible for fulfilling all the commercial content campaigns uh, from single page advertorials for small businesses to year long partnerships for multinational brands. And that includes digital builds, video and events. We're a team of 30 plus copywriters, designers, project managers, digital product developers and videographers split across sites in London and Bristol. So as well as producing content that appears across the entire immediate portfolio, we also work very closely with immediate sales teams on content strategy, supporting pitch work, which will involve anything from video treatments to print mockups, mood boards to microsite journeys. And as you can imagine, that's all been heavily influenced by what's been happening over the last few months. We've just celebrated our fourth birthday as a department just yesterday, and it's fair to say that the volume of work and the complexity of the partnerships we produce has really ramped up over the last year. So typically we work on about 150 campaigns at any given time. Um, here's just a few of the brands that we're currently working on. Um, and the campaigns come in varying degrees of complexity and length, but generally the content we produce is created specifically to sit within our brand's platforms. We're a generalist team, but we're required to reflect the knowledge and authority of many, many trusted specialist titles. Before we dig into the content itself, I'd like to really quickly reflect on how we responded to the initial lockdown and on some of the logistical challenges we faced. Imagine's always had a relatively progressive attitude to homeworking, but the reality of lockdown overtook our contingency plans somewhat. And at the beginning, not all team members have work laptops and server access, which provided some short term issues. Now we do occasionally have issues when it comes to downloading large graphics and video files, and also our universal type client can be prone to the odd crash, but these are tiny niggles and largely we've coped really well in terms of tech needs. And thankfully, we had a number of systems in place that enabled us to manage a high volume of projects around a large team spread over two sites. And these have been invaluable in enabling a swift move to home working. So we use Basecamp to manage campaigns, Slack to stay in touch, Asana to manage our workloads, and as a wider business, we've been using Microsoft Teams, so we're well placed. But computers and, uh, and systems are one thing, but people are much more complex. We're very much a people business at Media, and from the outset, it became clear that every member of our team was facing a different challenge around their own personal circumstances. All managers across Imagine have upped the time they spend checking in on their teams and displaying empathy and flexibility. And homeworking has conversely led to stronger relationships. Collaboration has been really, really important and making sure that we keep strong relationships uh, within a media as a whole. Uh, it's an essential part of what we do and we've seen the volume of cross departmental meetings ramp up as we lean on and support other departments. And that's always a balancing act, not wanting to fill the calendar with too many meetings. But it's particularly important in terms of our pitch work because now more than ever our ideas are being fueled by editorial insight and data. We know that the world is changing at a rapid pace. The rules are changing quickly and our users, communities and editorial teams can give us real insight into the public mood and behavioural change. Through panel surveys and website reporting and regular discussions with our editors, we can really understand how our communities are responding to lockdown, whether that be mums or cooks, gardeners or TV viewers. And this really influences our thinking when we're brainstorming ideas, as has seeing how our audiences are reacting to editorial content during lockdown. As a special interest publisher, we know the nation has turned to comforting old hobbies or begun new ones during lockdown. Looking at May's stats, users visiting Gardener's World site were up 269% uh, year on year. BBC Good Food users were up 126% and our new crafting site, Gathered, has seen a 54% increase in unique users in May alone. So that's really useful, but what's really, really useful is the more granular stuff. 
consumer information uh, that we get from traffic. So the fact that during VE Day, views to BBC Good Food's afternoon tea collection were up 70%, or the fact that despite the hot weather during lockdown, our readers have been making gallons of vegetable soup, and we even know which ingredients they're favouring, and that sort of stuff really helps fuel our decisions when we're building content strategies. So by collaborating with Editorial Insight, we can make sense of how consumers are behaving in these strange times and add real value to the pictures we work on. But what about live campaigns and the immediate impact on workload? Well, when lockdown was introduced, some clients within the most affected sectors either canceled or put their marketing plans on hold. The most heavily hit sectors were weddings, music, events, uh, travel and tourism and food. And for us, that meant that in the short term, our workload was immediately impacted, particularly around smaller campaigns. In all of these cases, we work with our clients to find the best solution, either moving their activity to a different platform, for example, from print to digital, or postponing the activity, or in some cases, cancelling. And for Imagine's project management team in particular, this meant an even higher level of client servicing, plenty of empathy, and a very flexible attitude to lead times as we worked to move activity and save business. For many smaller businesses with less experience in navigating the media landscape, we've had to guide them through a strange new world. Thankfully though, the majority of our content campaigns remained in place, and the next challenge was how to ensure our long-term partnerships stayed on track. So with that in mind, I'd like to take you through three of our biggest projects now, for Winnerlot, Tyrrells, and Dr. Erka, and talk a little bit about how we've had to tweak or rethink our content around COVID-19. Our ongoing British Dogs, Great British Dogs campaign, which we run in partnership with Winnerlot, features a website full of hundreds of uplifting, heartwarming stories of dog ownership, uploaded by dog owners. Each has a common thread, showing the love, companionship and support dogs can offer their owner, particularly those who are isolated or those suffering from mental or physical health issues. Once lockdown was introduced, we could see from the UGC we were receiving that the nation's dogs were providing more support for their owners than ever before. But with a suite of print advertorials going to press and print titles including Gardener's World, Radio Times and BBC Good Food, the question was how best to refer reference COVID-19. So while we did include some lockdown specific stories on the Great British Dog site, we made the decision to avoid direct reference to COVID-19 in our print activity and instead referenced it more uh, subtly, instead talking about how we were benefiting from spending more time with our dogs at home or talking about the calming, joyful influence that dogs can have on everyday life, particularly during anxious times. On our social platforms, we started using more user-generated content and polls to promote Great British Dogs. And this helped create a warmer face of the campaign and boost engagement during lockdown. The only other change was a shifting uh, the focus of social media activity to a monthly spot prize of a hamper, rather than the overarching prize on the site of a, a dog-friendly holiday, which obviously provides some issues around travel. Our work with uh, crisp brand Tyrrells features a series of print and digital advertorials running across BBC Good Food, BBC Gardener's World and Radio Times. Early in the partnership, we'd agree with Tyrrells which themes we wanted to address over the year-long campaign. But with lockdown looming, it soon became clear that topics like summer parties and outdoor film screenings were going to need some rethinking, particularly as some of the content was to be in print titles and government guidelines could be relaxed or tightened at any time. One of the issues we face with print over a period of rapid change is lead times and on sale times, making it hard to be reactive. However, it's also widely recognized that print brands have a massive role to play in times of uncertainty, as they're hugely trusted by consumers and offer escapism and me time. Once again, we lent on insight from our food brands and radio times to switch our strategy and focus instead on more future-proof topics, making small family gatherings at home more special, or the importance of using locally sourced ingredients. In Radio Times, we were keen to reflect on the growing amount of great audio content that's come out of lockdown, particularly podcasts and radio. And this married up well with the idea of enjoying, out enjoying outdoors in limited numbers. So since launching back in April, our partnership with Dr. Erka has consistently outperformed expectations. However, it hasn't been without its challenges due to lockdown. Challenges that have, again, required us to be flexible and lean on great client relationships and leverage our brand's insight. At the centre of the Dr. Erka partnership is a 30-page website. It went live just before Easter and was completed in lockdown. Thankfully, all creative assets have been produced by this time, but it soon became clear that we had another challenge. Having already tested, shot and written 23 recipes, we were suddenly confronted with the challenge that big, key baking ingredients like flour and eggs 
were in short supply and unavailable to many customers. So by adapting our combined social strategy, we consciously promoted Easter recipes with more accessible ingredients, particularly championing recipes without eggs or flour. Our no-bake white chocolate cheesecake recipe generated more than 100,000 page views in the first week and currently exceeds the next popular recipe by 87%. But what next? Using the BBC Good Food data, we tracked weekly fluctuations in the most popular recipes, which gave us an idea of the ingredients consumers were able to buy. Once BBC Good Food's top 10 most searched recipes consistently included flour, we were confident in expanding our promotion across a wider variety of bakes, with user interest reflecting our informed assumptions. So now I'd like to hand you over to Becca Bright, Imagine's Head of Design, who will talk about how happily we've managed to shoot food content under lockdown conditions, specifically the food brand Napolina. Thanks, JB. Hi, I'm Becca and I'm the Head of Design at Imagine. I'm gonna talk through our ongoing Napolina project and how we've ad adapted our process during the pandemic. The Napolina partnership was originally intended to go live over the summer and feature at the BBC Good Food Summer Show, which unfortunately was cancelled due to lockdown. Thanks to some quick thinking and flexibility on the part of the Napolina client, their agency, Wavemaker and the Imagine team, we've been able to shift the focus to the BBC Good Food Autumn Show. We had originally planned to shoot recipe assets during the second week of April, but started the process of moving our shoot in early March, as soon as we became aware that lockdown was imminent. Of course, our first concern is always the safety of our team, the photographers, the food stylists, etc. But it quickly became apparent that in addition to lockdown, we faced another challenge. Recipe development and testing was made almost impossible as supermarket shelves all over the country were empty and the likelihood of getting a delivery slot was extremely low. Pasta was one of the main ingredients that we couldn't get hold of, as well as many of the tin products that Napolina wanted to feature. Even the clients themselves were struggling to supply these to us as they couldn't keep up with public demand. Our plans around the rescheduled shoot itself had to be very flexible as it was difficult to predict when we would be able to start shooting again. Food issues aside, the plans had to consider when we would be able to get the required number of people in the room, when and how we'd be able to travel to the shoot location, what precautions we would need to have in place, what were our obligations to the team and what risk assessments were needed. Thankfully, Napolina has been really understanding. We've amended the seasonal focus of some of our recipes to reflect the new live dates, and luckily product availability for the public, as well as the client, improved over the coming weeks. So we managed to test and refine these recipes prior to the shoot. We prepared ourselves as much as possible so that we were able to proceed as soon as we got the green light from our facilities team. The shoot for Napolina took place last week after we pushed the date back as late as we could and waited for the advice that it was safe to start shooting again with obvious restrictions. The actual day looked really different to our usual client shoots. For instance, there were only three people on set, the home economist, the photographer and an art director, with the client, media agency and project manager all communicating remotely. Because of this, we sent the stills and video clips through to the client for sign off throughout the day. We carefully selected studios with strict social distancing and cleaning, cleaning measures in place to be sure that all team members were as safe as possible. Though we have Though we've been keen to get back to creating content, our teams are incredibly important to us as well as their safety. So we had to be confident that those carrying out the shoot had made the choice to do so themselves. This shooting process has run really smoothly despite all the challenges we faced. We've come through this period with some great creatives, a really happy client and some strong relationships moving forward. Of course, we'd rather collaborate with our clients and agencies on set and look forward to doing so as soon as we're able, but it's been really satisfying to be able to shoot under lockdown and keep the campaign on track. I'll now hand you over to Ramsey, one of Imagine's art directors, who's gonna to talk to you about some of the challenges that we had shooting a campaign for Lego under lockdown. Thanks, Becca. Hello, everyone. Uh, first off, a bit of background on our Lego partnership with Top Gear. In 20, 2019, we partnered with Lego for the first time to create content that would support their I Love Cars campaign. This year, that campaign was to be renamed and refreshed with new content focused on their smaller Speed Champions range of toy cars. The real cornerstones of this project for us have been an excellent working relationship with the client and a very high standard of creative output to ensure that we were producing visuals worthy of both Lego and Top Gear brands. Four days before we were due to shoot for this year's campaign, the UK went into full lockdown. So that's fun. Uh, obviously, this presented us with some significant challenges. However, thanks to both our excellent client relationship and the preparation that we put in in advance of the day itself, 
we were able we were able to overcome them. As the creative approach was so vital to the success of, the, of this project, a lot of the work we did early on, like creating mood boards, liaising with the client and working with the photographer to plan the finer details of the shoot, actually became an essential factor in our preparedness for lockdown. As with our previous work with LEGO, the creative concept here involved shooting their miniature cars as though they were full-size vehicles in a way that is visually familiar to Top Gear readers. Top Gear's annual Speed Week event, where the editorial team gather a handful of the world's most desirable cars in one place, usually a racetrack, uh, felt like a great thing to riff on with our Lego campaign. This year, we worked with photographer Wilson Hennessy. Uh, his background in both real-life car and smaller product-based studio photography was ideal for what we were setting out to achieve. So prior to lockdown, uh, Wilson was actually able to transport essential kit from his studio to his home. And in the space of two days, he converted his garage, which you can see here, into a makeshift studio. Uh, so the shoot was able to go ahead as planned. Obviously, we weren't able to be present. Uh, normally, there would be a group of several people there, including the client. Uh, but in this instance, we adapted by using WhatsApp. So I thought it would be cool to talk you through how this process actually played out uh, and how, how we got from shoot day to live day whilst working in isolation. Our most immediate problem uh, was that we had a handful of Lego products that we needed to shoot, uh, many of which were not built. Uh, these were delivered directly to the photographer well in advance of our shoot day. Fortunately, building Lego is not something that most people would consider a hardship. So Wilson, together with his kids, who were obviously not at school, uh, were happy to take on that challenge. The approach that Wilson and I settled on uh, involved shooting a simple setup like the one you see here, and then doing most of the work in post-production. This turned out to be really beneficial because it meant we could change things on the fly much more easily, allowing the client to feedback as we went along. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a WhatsApp group set up that allowed myself, the project manager, and the client to communicate on the day. Uh, I was in constant contact with Wilson over email and phone calls, and then once we had something we were both happy with, this would get sent to the client via WhatsApp for approval. If there was ever a short delay, the easy setup meant that we could always crack on with the next product if needed. So once the client signed off on the basic positionals of each car, we could start looking at which backdrop to use. Uh, what you see here is a really rough composition using an existing background, and um, one of the first car shots that Wilson took on a day. This process is a really difficult thing to get right as perspective, scale, lighting, and color all need to be spot on for the effect of work. Uh, so these went to the client a few days after the shoot, this time over email, to approve the rough composition. Once we had approval on those, we could start work on the final shots, like this one. In total, we shot seven products in the space of two days, and all seven of these went from first drafts to final client-approved compositions within the space of two weeks, all whilst working remotely. Uh, these images were then used across print in Top Gear magazine's June issue, and digitally on our newly redesigned hub, as well as digital display, digital display ads and social media. The client response has been really great, so much so that we're already talking about what we could produce next, so watch this space. Um, before I go, I wanted to talk a bit about picture selection during lockdown. Um, there are some key considerations when it comes to design, particularly around image selection. Uh, we can't always create the images ourselves and often have to rely on stock imagery to convey a scene or give context. With the possibility that restrictions can change from day to day, we have to be really careful to ensure we are showing people, places and practices that are following these guidelines, or the government guidelines, sorry. Uh, to this end, we've mainly selected images of people in their home or garden environments uh, and usually with those people from their household. When searching for stock images, there are now many more shots featuring people wearing masks. However, we've tried to avoid showing these as they can be triggering for some people. The key consideration with imagery is location. Where do the people look like they are? If they are with others, are they following social distancing measures? Obviously, things like crowds are a no-no at the moment. Next up, uh, we've got Imagine's head of video, Ross Shepard, who's going to talk a bit about our recent shoots, uh, video shoots, and how our video content has developed over the last few months. Thanks, Ramsey. Uh, I'm Ross, head of video, uh, Imagine, and I wanted to take some time to talk to you and take you through some of the great work we've been doing with nano influencers over the last few months. So starting with uh, Lego Duplo, take 10 to play. One element of our video work that has been particularly gratifying over this period of lockdown has been our work with super engaged nano influencers of the Made for Mums community. 
We've been working with Lego Duplo to produce a series of videos and stills showing real families playing various games with Lego Duplo. All the footage has been self-filmed and then pulled together by our video team at Imagine. So happily, we've been able to draw on learnings from other recent campaigns uh, for the likes of Heinz for Baby, which we completed just before lockdown. Of course, we've all had to quickly become used to looking at video content that has been filmed in this way. And there are times uh, that it can appear inauthentic. However, we've run a number of campaigns this way prior to lockdown, and it felt as though this type of footage was a great relatable way to bring the campaign to life. With more of us spending more time with our children, the campaign couldn't have been uh, better timed. So here are five pointers on how to get the best out of members of the public shooting content. So number one, pilot videos. The problem with user-generated content is storyboarding and shot listing just isn't really possible uh, to provide your client with a clear idea of what the end product will look and feel like. So we've been making short example videos or pilots for them to take inspiration from. And we've either been shooting them ourselves or using reference footage that we can find online to pull together a pilot piece. So in the case of both Heinz for Baby and Lego Duplo, the end result has actually been really well guided by this work putting together pilots. Number two, recruitment. We found that it's really essential to reach out to parents we've been working with and ask them to submit a short piece of video as part of the recruitment process for the campaign. Um, it can be a lot of work to go through all the entries in this way, but it really helps give a strong sense of what that person will be like to work with and how their footage will look. So that's, that's been really key. Uh, number three, briefing process. Um, initially, we tried briefing our parents through, um, through notes um, and through kind of written brief materials, but for Lego Duplo, we changed the way we work and took our parents through a short deck, uh, which covered the key areas we wanted uh, wanted them to consider when getting their footage. So we spoke with them individually, and that's a member of the video team speaking directly to that parent, um, and we showed them the pilot video that we'd put together, which made for a much smoother process and gave them some sort of visual reference for what we were looking for and helped us break it down for them in a much more relatable way. Um, it also gave us much better level of consistency across all of the footage that we received back. So number four is having some contingency with filming. So we've been factoring in a contingency shoot when it comes to the project timeline. So we can always go back and ask our subject, subjects for some more content and it won't be a surprise for them if we do that because we would have made them aware of that contingency timeline. So that way if the client um, asks for changes and we can't satisfy that work in the edit, we can always go back and have another go with the parents, with the influencer to, to get more footage from them. So if this is built into the plans from the start then it makes a much smoother process overall. Number five really is just expect the unexpected. Um, so when it comes to user generated content, there'll always just be a few surprises that you can't allow for. And since lockdown, we've had multiple tech issues with file sharing and had to find alternate tools uh, to resolve some of those things that we just couldn't have predicted. There have also been hiccups with lighting, audio quality and framing. Um, you know, one parent who's been shooting for us has the latest iPhone, for instance, which is obviously great for filming video and getting great imagery, but it turns out that that was so new um, that our video editing tools didn't have the required codecs and you know our systems needed updating to work with that. So those little things just add more time into a project than you can necessarily estimate up front. So expecting the unexpected is definitely uh, worth uh, trying to factor in. Cool, so I'm um, gonna talk a little bit now about um, editorial video. Um, so as an internal creative studio, we do lots of work for other departments within a media. And this can typically include shoots for likes of BBC Ghana's World, where they're reviewing products and interviewing talent from the BBC TV show, or it might involve attending red carpet events with Radio Times. And obviously we normally film a lot of studio in our own, uh, sorry, we we'll normally film a lot of content in our own studio. When lockdown began, none of our usual editorial activity was possible. And then all of a sudden our brands were faced with a difficult challenge of how to reach their viewers. And conversely, due to the sudden increase in video traffic to all of our sites during the lockdown period, the audience for video was all of a sudden much larger than ever, but we weren't able to fall back on any of our usual formats. So this has led to a number of new uh, pieces of work, um, which have varied 
by Editorial Brand, so we started Radio Times. We've supported their uh, web based, uh, webcam based interviews and watch along series that they've been running on, on various channels. We worked on a recent um, Q&A with Ricky Gervais to promote the second season of Afterlife um, and also video content for an hour long uh, Radio Times TV quiz, which also featured several um, celeb contributors just filming themselves on their phones. So these online um, video events have been really su successful for Radio Times and it's great that they've gathered such good traction with their online community. Switched On is a daily format that runs on the Radio Times social channels and you can see two grabs from it there. Um, so launched just before lockdown, the series originally featured a studio based presenter reading from an auto cue to camera. Um, so we adapted that to become a VO based um, image driven format um, and we've been able to continue delivering it as a daily video um, seven days a week without fail all across the lockdown period um, since March. So that, you know, that's a nice, a nice way to adapt the content and keep it going. Um, just moving on to the next slide with Garner's World, we've been working with their editorial team, um, again, to shoot their own pieces to camera from home, which we've then been bringing together in a sort of polished wrapper, um, you know, in various ways with some motion graphics and design elements added in. Um, so they've had huge success with a weekly show called Ask David. Um, this features David Hurrian, one of their regular um, contributors, answering reader questions from his garden throughout the lockdown period. We've also been creating lots of new uh, social media video formats to help the brand reach new audience, uh, the new audience of gardeners, which has emerged during lockdown. Um, so there was an Instagram series called hashtag so along uh, where we created some short snappy how to videos shot on iPhone uh, by a member of the Garners World marketing team, um, which we then created into a sort of template that they could take moving forward. Um, we've also been working on the first ever Garners World online webinar masterclass. Um, which was packed with bespoke video content, again, shot and edited during lockdown. The webinar took place a couple of weeks ago and got off to a really good start with uh, 225 paying customers. And we received some really positive feedback from that and we're getting, getting to work on the next one now. Um, we've also adapted the house style for Olive recipe videos and you can see a couple of grabs there. Um, we've been working with their really good uh, food team, guiding them on how to shoot step-by-step -step recipe content in their own kitchens, on their own phones, which we've been then editing into this new series. All of that content's been cut down into 15 second step-by-step -step, uh, videos, delivered in a portrait and square format for social media, especially Instagram. And that's all part of a new approach for the brand as they look to develop content for their hashtag uh, spread joy, not germs campaign. So it's been a really interesting period for us, uh, making videos with tools we've not used before and coming up with formats to support what has been a very agile environment for our brands. And I actually think that when we're on the other side of COVID, a lot of these techniques and processes will remain in place actually, as we've seen some really solid results uh, from these kind of emerging video strategies that our brands have been pushing out. Okay, so I'll hand you back to JB now. Um, and he's got some useful tips for copywriting around COVID and some closing points. Thanks so much, Becca, Ramsey and Ross. That was brilliant. Um, just, yeah, what about copying, uh, copywriting and the written word and COVID and how we reflect the situation? There's a number of really simple do's and don'ts. Um, we've all seen what happens when brands get it wrong in terms of their content not reflecting what's going on. It can be really jarring and it's especially important that we get this right as our editorial brands are built on a foundation of trust and expertise. From day one, it was really vital we weren't seen to be capitalising on the situation and that our advertorials, digital display and social posts were reflective of the public mood and responsible in the language they employed. So here's three key pointers from Imagine's copy team that we always keep in mind when copywriting against the backdrop of coronavirus. So firstly, uh, don't explicitly refer to coronavirus or COVID-19 or the global pandemic. Instead, uh, gently make reference to the situation about how we're spending more time at home with loved ones, for, exa for example. Uh, secondly, always be empathetic to how readers may be feeling. Um, try to pick up on any heartwarming shared experience that people will relate to, for example, with Winlot, um, how we talk about uh, how dog owners are appreciating their dogs more than ever. Um, and thirdly, uh, just be really conscious of promotions and competitions and angles which may not be feasible during this time. Uh, and try and soften uh, calls to action from direct instructions like call now to softer phrases like start planning. 
So that's pretty much it for us from Imagine. There's been a number of things that we hope will be positive uh, learnings moving forwards from this period in lockdown, uh, you know, around geography and collaboration, uh, around our brainstorming process, around checking in on each other more regularly, um, about finding out more about the wider content marketplace and also about um, learning new skills that we're, you know, putting together to, to navigate this world, um, skills including this webinar. Uh, but now I'd like to just end by saying thanks very much and uh, hand you back to George. Thank you so much, uh, JB, Becca, James and Ross. It sounds like you guys have been doing an incredible job and making the most of the opportunities presented in the past few months. So we're now lucky enough to be joined uh, for a Q&A with George Scott, editor of Bike Radar. Great name, by the way. Um, thank you for joining us, George. Hi, George. How are you doing? It's nice and easy. Yeah, very easy. I hope that won't become too complicated. Um, I thought it might be good if you could just start by telling us a little bit about Bike Radar and, uh, and all, all about that brand. Sure. So we are a team of 11 uh, on the editorial team, normally based in immediate Bristol offices. Uh, and we're part of the, the cycling portfolio. So that also includes Cycling Plus magazine and MBUK magazine. Uh, and then Bike Radar is um, a multimedia brand. So we have the website, which is um, our main offering. We then have a YouTube channel, which in, in May just passed 600,000 subscribers. And we have a podcast as well, which we launched about a year ago. Um, and our broad editorial mission is to cover two main, main themes, to provide the best, uh, most authoritative, independent advice we can. So both riding advice and uh, buying advice. Um, but also to, to try and entertain and inform our readers so they can enjoy the sport as much as we do, because we're all cyclists on the team. Amazing. So it's been obviously a really interesting uh, past three, three months now, um, and I'm sure that coronavirus has had quite a big knock-on effect on, uh, on Bike Radar, but how has it directly affected your content plans? Mm, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, like like all publishers and, and all businesses, really, we've we've had to adapt very quickly, not just to a new way of working, but also a new way in which our, our customers, whether they're readers, listeners, uh, viewers, are engaging with, with our product, with our content. Um, so, you know, I think there's yeah, there's very few benefits to to the last few months as, as we've seen, but. You know, one of one of the upsides for us has been the number of people turning to cycling. Um, I'm sure most of us here and, and listening in, uh, whether you cycle or not, will have noticed lots of people riding through lockdown um, and cycling in the news as well. The government, um, so there's been yeah, a ton of people on the on the street initially riding as as a great way to get out and enjoy your daily exercise. Um, but now people are increasingly either sticking with the sport because they've dusted off an old, an old bike in lockdown or um, perhaps looking at, uh, looking at riding as a way to, to get back into the office to commute um, when the time comes. So you know, two main things have happened for us. We've had to adapt our existing plans, um, particularly around product launches, which are a key part of what we do at this time of year, video shoots, product testing, which we, we paused through the, the first phase of the, uh, the lockdown, um, but also to seek out new opportunities. Um, and we're quite fortunate on, on Bike Radar that the site is a very broad church. We cover most forms of cycling, right from um, your beginners all the way up to people spending potentially £10,000 on the next bike, um, but also road cycling, mountain biking, commuting, gravel riding. Um, so we've got a wealth of knowledge and a, and a wealth of existing content in the team. Um, but the main change for us over the last few months is that we we noticed very quickly in the lockdown through the data that we that we use um, that our beginner focused, our entry level content is picking up a lot of traffic. So we we pivoted very quickly to focusing on the area of the site, um, and that's you know that's the role we've had to play through this really. That's what I said to the team early on. Um, you know we only have a very small role, but if we can help more people get out on bikes and enjoy the sport we love, stick with it after the pandemic, um, and, and give them the best advice we can then you know, that's, that's the job that we've been focusing on over the last, uh, over the last three months. Um, so it's been a very busy time. You know, we've seen record traffic to the site, record traffic to the, to the YouTube channel and the podcast, um, but also a really satisfying um, period at the same time, even though it's, it's obviously had its challenges. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, every, it's probably had challenges for everyone. So um, you mentioned briefly just there that you've been using some data to, to guide your content creation and, 
Um, I mean, Bike Radar is a very much a specialist brand and has and has been um, for for many years. So, how have you been utilizing data, and so what tools have you been using to utilize that data to to pivot that content strategy? Mm. So we we're very fortunate as a as a digital brand to you know we have an, an endless stream of of data at our fingertips. Um, which I think, yeah, in some respects, can be a blessing and a curse. You, of course, you can you can get um, kind of bogged down in too much data, but we we're very fortunate to to have that, um, and yeah, you know, we use it in a few ways. So, um, we you know, like most online brands, we use Google Analytics to to monitor traffic performance, um, but also to see um, to identify where we've been seeing spikes in existing content. Um, so we have a dashboard set up. Um, looking at the, the tens of thousands of articles we've got on the site um, and what within that uh, has seen the most year on year growth or the most week on week, week, on week growth. Um, we can then look at that content and determine is that doing the best job it can in terms of answering the, the user query if they're coming from Google, for example. So that's, that's been a big focus for us, making sure our existing content is, is up to date and relevant. Um, and also off the back of that, you know, search. Search is a massive traffic driver for us, um, drives the majority of our traffic. So um, tracking our, our ranking performance, we use a tool called Ahrefs, there's, there's a few available, um, but tracking our, our ranking on, on Google through for our, our key content um, is really important as a day-to-day -day job for us. So you know, just a small shift up and down um, on a particular keyword can have a big impact on the performance of a, an individual piece of content. Um, dropping from second to fourth, for example, um, you know, that's you know, that's that's something that we we're constantly keeping on top of. Um, yeah. But then also also looking ahead, um, you know, particularly through through the pandemic, where we've seen you know huge demand for cycling content, uh, you know, using data to identify new opportunities and spotting what the emerging search trends are, so we can produce new content off the back of that. Um, you know, that's that's been really important as well. Yeah, yeah, no, data is definitely uh, one one key top tip for uh, for creating the right content during this period. So you've mentioned that you, obviously, you've got your website and you've got video and you've got uh, lots of different types of content on there. But on top of that, Bike Radar has a very strong YouTube channel and also a podcast. Um, have you had to pivot these uh, content formats as well towards what's going on or have they remained the same? Well, uh, you know, certainly with the with the podcast, that's that's about a year old for us now, um, and we made made the decision at the start of lockdown to in, increase our podcast output from once a week on a Monday to twice a week, so Monday and Friday. And I think we made that decision, you know, partly off the back of we enjoy doing podcasts when we're not spending time with each other in, in the office. It's it's a way for us to to get together and, and chat, um, but also it's a way for us to you know try and entertain and distract and. Um, you know, kind of uh, help our, our readers, our listeners through the through the pandemic. So um, that was a decision we made very quickly, um, and we you know, we cover a broad range of topics on on the podcast. We sometimes we focus on uh, kind of the week's top news stories on the site. Um, we've covered cycle cycle commuting, our, our tips for you know, getting on the bike to get back to work when you need to. Um, you know, what you should spend your money on if you've got five hundred pounds to spend on a bike, which is a real key price point for for new riders. Um, right through to uh, the kind of techiest deep dives on um, on topics that our, our kind of core audience can really geek out on, which we love doing as well. Um, and that's that's been a key challenge for us across all formats is um, creating content that appeals to the new audience coming into the sport, but also to our core specialist audience. Um, and then same story on, on the YouTube channel, really. Uh, you know, certainly compared to podcasts and and the website. It's uh, a lot more difficult, as as other people have explained this afternoon, to produce video through through the lockdown than it is for someone individually to sit at home and write an article. So we you know we've definitely gone through a period of um, you know ensuring that our filmers are set up at home, ensuring some of our writers who are normally our key presenters on the channel are set up to self shoot at home, overcoming sound issues, camera issues, lighting issues if someone's. Um, shooting a bike launch from their uh, from their front room or from their bedroom. Um, so, yeah, I think logistically it's been a, a tricky spell for the channel. Um, but also what we've learned off the back of it is actually our audience is very sympathetic to the situation. Um, you know, this is a good time to experiment with different formats. Um, you know, we've seen real success off the back of that. Um, 
So you know, again, we've tried to cater to our core audience. You know, we, we presented a couple of um, kind of tech Q and A's from, um, from some of our key writers, living rooms, uh, kind of running, running the audience through um, the latest products to arrive um, at Radar. Um, but also we, we've covered the real key, um, you know, broad brush topics. So the best 1000 pound road bikes, that's probably been our top video over the last couple of months. So um, a similar content strategy, but you know, executed slightly differently. Yeah, for sure. And I imagine being a digital brand has probably helped you guys quite a lot in adjusting to that sort of uh, lockdown normal, which has been working from home. Have you seen the, uh, the people and the team that you've got? Because it's quite a big team have adjusted to all of that. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, we were, we were fortunate in that we, you know, we're, we're digital. So, you know, by definition, it was easier for us to, to move and work from home than perhaps some of the, some of the print brands. Um, but, um, you know, so we could get set up at home quite quickly, but, uh, you know, as has already been said this afternoon, you know, it's been very important for the team to, to check in on a regular basis. You know, we, we catch up on a Monday and a Thursday and a Friday, just so we have that, that kind of FaceTime across the team. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone's adapted to the situation really well. Um, you know, we're, we're all bike riders, so we've all been riding a lot through this as well. Um, not together, but you know, on, on our own to... Um, I was going to say, I think I've seen some group Zwift rides uh, that you guys have been doing as well, haven't you? Yeah, so we, we, particularly through the early days when uh, when the weather was a bit colder or, or we were very much stuck at home and couldn't get out too much, we, we had kind of team rides on Zwift, which were great fun. Um, but, you know, that's, I think that's something that everyone who's ridden the bike over the last few months is, has appreciated, is that you know, cycling is such a great way to escape after the end of a busy day and that's exactly the same for us even though we're we're kind of writing about the sport in the you know, in the daytime we still like to get out on the bike and um you know kind of unwind um after work for sure no i've been doing the same um, and i've got a couple of uh pieces of content that you guys have been creating over uh, on the screen now um but as the uk sort of looks to be returning to work and, and offices are opening back up um and the lockdown is being eased uh, how do you think that sort of return to work is going to affect your content plans? Yeah, it's, um, so the, the key for us is, you know, as of now, I think my doorbell has just gone off, which is... Uh, I mean, talk, talk about relatable content. Uh, <laughs> there we go, it's, it's finished now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, so we've resumed testing, um, which is a key part of what we do, product testing. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a key part of our... Uh, content strategy that's back up and running. Um, you know, whilst in the early days of the lockdown, we saw uh, most brands cancel their um, their product launches. They have started again, um, being done on on Zoom or um, over webcasts. Um, but a really key focus for us over the next couple of months are two quite new content strands. Um, one's around cycle commuting, so we have a wealth of content on commuting, but just making sure that for all those new riders who are picking up a bike uh, to ride to work, uh, that we're there for them. Um, but then also around around e-bikes, which is a, a massively growing part of the sport at the moment. Um, so again, uh, you know, making sure that our e-bike content is where it needs to be, um, because a lot of people who perhaps aren't uh, in our, our kind of traditional core audience are going to be looking at an e-bike to get back to work um, without having to get on public transport. Yeah, and I guess the other thing for for bike radar is um, the long term opportunity around here. I mean. Um, cycling's grown a, a massive amount as you say people have been dusting off their old bikes or people have been looking to the cycle to work scheme to be able to to get a bike for commuting um, obviously this is a relatively specialist content area um, and we have a few brands and, and marketing agencies on the call today so have you got any uh, top tips for how uh, they might be able to adjust their content strategy towards and I, I, I hate to say it but the new normal I think you know, the, the key for us um you know, if you, if you have data at your disposal, then, you know, use it as much as you can. You know, it's such a valuable resource um, to understand uh, what content really chimes with your audience, perhaps what hasn't worked, what you can adapt to make work better in future. Um, if you've got the data there, if you've got the data there, try, try and use it as best you can. Um, but I think also on the flip side, um, don't be afraid to fail. You know, this has been a really good opportunity for for media brands and, and brands as a whole to, to try something new, um, particularly online where there is room to experiment. Um, and then you know, related to that, it's, it's been really important for us through this period to make our content as relatable as possible. Um, you know, we've, we've got very high standards, but you know, by the nature of the lockdown, you can't always quite hit the same 
level of quality that you would if you were shooting in our video studio in the office, for example. Um, but having, you know, bringing uh, viewers on our YouTube channel into your own home to show them the latest product, I think really chimes with them. We've had a lot of good feedback off the back of that. Um, and also just finally, I think, make the most of the people and the personalities you have. You know, that's, that's really important for us on White Radar. It's a key part of what we do, both on the site and on the channel. Um, you know, of course, the brand is important, but also the individual brand of our writers is, is equally important. And that's something I, I really reinforce with the team. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's it. Use data um, to inform your decisions, but don't be afraid to use personality as well. Yeah, they're, they're all fantastic takeaways. They, they seem to be uh, a sort of a running theme throughout today's session. I think both Imagine and, and, and George from Byte Radar, you've kind of related to uh, to utilising data and also making making the most of the opportunities that are, that are there now um, and making the most of the audience that is there to consume the content now as well. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us and, and, and sharing that interesting and, and really very valuable insight into Byte Radar. I really appreciate that. And um, I hope that everyone uh, tuning in today did as well. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, and I hope you, your parcels all arrived safely. Um, so uh, that's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what we've been up to and how we're adapting to that new normal. Um, we appreciate we've covered quite a lot. Um, and so we are going to follow up tomorrow with an on-demand version of this webinar. Um, as a YouTube link, as I mentioned, um, and we'll also have the deck in there um, for you to refer back to if you'd like. Um, but really quickly before we finish, I want to highlight um, how we could help you during this time um, and also moving forward. Um, I'd like to, uh, I mean, the most important thing for, for, for me to say here is that um, we're here to help. We understand that times are tough um, and making decisions about any marketing or, or content has been really tricky. Um, and that's why we'd like to encourage you to get in contact with us and speak to us. Um, and we'll then use our knowledge, data and insight to, to help you thrive. Um, so the best email address is on the screen now on the slide um, to get in contact with us. I'm 360immediate.co.uk um, and we'll get back to you. We'll put you in touch with the magazine. We'll be able to um, put you in touch with uh, whoever might be most suitable there. So secondly, um, as the special interest uh, content and marketing publisher, content is our bread and butter. Um, we heard from Imagine earlier about some of the amazing commercial work they've been doing over the past couple of months. Those Lego photos were fantastic. Um, so if you'd like to discuss any upcoming projects or marketing activity, please do reach out to one of our sales teams or alternatively do get in contact with us via that email and we'll put you in touch with the right team. So uh, that is it from us today. Um, again, a massive thank you for joining us. Uh, we really hope you found it useful. I'll be in touch tomorrow. And in the meantime, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and we hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks so much, guys.